Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at radio frequency amplifiers, in particular at the class C amplifier. This is quite a widely used circuit that is useful for both final stage power amplification as well as some signal processing applications. So what I want to do today is look at how it works, what are its limitations, and what are some of the design considerations that need to be taken into account when using such a circuit. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So to start things off, what is a class C amplifier? And what makes the various amplifier classes special? Well, in just a few words, class A, A, B, B, and C are considered linear amplifiers. And class D, E, and F are considered switching amplifiers. There are some other classes also, but let's focus on these for the moment. Now, regarding the linear amplifiers, the main difference between them is how the amplifying element, the transistor or valve, is being driven in relation to an input sine wave. So for how much of the sine wave is the amplifying element actually conducting? So what is its conduction angle? For the class C amplifier, the amplifying element is driven with less than 180 degrees of conduction angle. So in other words, in a class C amplifier, the amplifying element will actually be amplifying for less than half a period. But the output signal is still a sine wave. Let's look into this in a bit more detail. So the way in which this is achieved is by using an LC resonance circuit. It can be connected in different ways, but for today's explanations, let's keep it in the collector. So the idea here is that the resonator works like a mechanical pendulum or swing. You can give it energy from time to time when it reaches one of the extreme positions and it will oscillate. When you're not providing any energy, it has its own momentum and it still creates a sine wave oscillation. Of course, you also need to have a load and do something with the energy coming from the amplifier. So what you end up with is a parallel RLC circuit. And one key aspect in designing the class C amplifier is to make sure this RLC circuit can actually complete a clean oscillation based on the energy stored when the amplifying element was conducting. So what I prepared here is a basic LT spice simulation with a parallel RLC circuit, which also has an initial voltage of one volt set into it. So if we run the simulation to observe what happens, we can see that there's an oscillation appearing, which is slowly being dampened in time as the energy in the circuit is delivered to the load. Now, to get a sense of how this will behave, we can calculate the Q factor of the circuit. So for this particular circuit, we have a Q factor of 10.8. So if we change the Q factor, for example, this circuit has a Q factor of 108, and we look at how it behaves, we can see the oscillation being maintained for a longer period of time. And of course we can go into the other extreme. So to have a Q factor of only one, and if we look at this, well, this doesn't really oscillate. You only have a glitch at the beginning and then it almost instantaneously stops. So for class C, correct operation, usually a loaded Q factor, so for the circuit with the load, of at least five is recommended. Now, since the oscillation is defined by the used components, so their resonance frequency, this is the first important limitation. The class C amplifier is a relatively narrow band circuit. It can only amplify a specific frequency range defined by the components that are used to build it. So you will never see this in something like an audio application where wide band is necessary. The class C is mainly a radio frequency amplifier. To get a sense of what bandwidth the amplifier has, again the Q factor will help, since this is an expression of the resonance frequency divided by the resonance width. Higher Q factor means narrower bandwidth. So we can again analyze our previous circuits, but this time perform an AC simulation, so to get a sense of the impedance of the circuit. And from this we can determine the bandwidth. So if we look at our first circuit that had a Q factor of 10.8, we see the resonance frequency at about 730 something kilohertz. And then we see how its impedance drops off to the left and to the right. If we check out the other circuit, so the one with 108, 
we can see that we have exactly the same resonance frequency, but the minus 3 decibel interval, so which is defined as the bandwidth, is much, much narrower. So it's only a very small interval close to the center frequency, whereas for the other, it was much wider. And of course, finally, for our Q factor of 1, we have a very wide bandwidth, but that's not really helping us. Now, coming back to the pendulum analogy, the first interesting property to observe is that you don't have to give energy in every single cycle. So if the oscillator has enough momentum, you can skip a few cycles. So one use case of the class C amplifier is that of frequency multiplication. So it's commonly used as a frequency doubler or tripler. So when you know exactly the input frequency and the output frequency that you want, rather than building a phase lock loop or some other complex device, you can simply build this thing and tune the LC circuit to the desired frequency multiple. This way you can easily get a bunch of frequency multiples to be used for further processes. So this time I took the RLC circuit that had the Q factor of 10.8 and I also added a transistor. And then I copied the exact same circuit multiple times and the difference between them is the frequency at which I'm driving the transistor. So in the first circuit I'm driving it with exactly the resonance frequency, 734 kilohertz. In the second one I'm driving it with half that, so 367 kilohertz. And in the final circuit I'm driving it with only a third of the frequency, 245 kilohertz. So if we run the simulation, we can see that the first circuit, well, works correctly, it oscillates, it generates a continuous oscillation at our frequency of interest. If we look at the second circuit, it's still oscillating at our frequency of interest, but we can see that our second oscillation is dying down. So since the RLC circuit has an R, there's a load that is consuming energy, the sine wave is slowly diminishing. And with the final circuit, this is even more obvious. So even though it's not a perfectly continuous sine wave, we still have a frequency multiple of the initial signal. Now in theory you can go to any frequency multiple using this approach, but if the frequency multiple is too high then the circuit will become unreliable. Now another thing that the pendulum analogy should help explain is the output voltage swing. So with our circuit when the amplifier is not switching, you get a standby position when the output voltage is equal to the supply voltage. For the pendulum, this is the lowest point. Now when the switch is on, the output is pulled to ground and with the pendulum, it's pulled to one of the sides. So this will represent zero volts and the middle, the supply voltage. Now when I let go of the pendulum, it swings clearly past the standby position all the way to a symmetrical point on the other side, which in the electronic circuit appears as double the supply voltage. So another property of the class C amplifier is that the peak to peak output voltage is two times the supply voltage. This raises an interesting and problematic point. The input signal amplitude doesn't matter as much as the supply voltage. So if you want to change the output amplitude, you need to change the supply voltage. So to show this, we can come back to the circuit that we previously analyzed, so the one with the transistor and the input frequency being the one that is on the output. But rather than supplying it from a fixed voltage, we can supply it from a offsetted sine wave. So if I run the simulation, the supply voltage is 10 volts plus a 1 volt 10 kilohertz sine wave. So peak to peak value is 2 volts. And if we look at the output of the circuit, we can see that it's a, well, a high frequency sine wave. But if we zoom out, we can see that its envelope follows the supply voltage. So to get an even better look at this, to see if the amplitude modulation worked, we can look at its frequency spectrum, so using the FFT feature, and we can zoom in. So the center frequency is at about 700 and something kilohertz. And we can clearly see the typical amplitude modulation spectrum. We have the central carrier frequency and the two sidebands. But if you think about it, if the supply voltage is fixed, for example, you only have 10 volts, and the load is fixed, you have a 50 ohm antenna, then the output power is fixed. You should get about 1 watt. Well, that's not good. 
I mean, what if you want more or less power? Well, this is when impedance matching comes into play. You can design the initial amplifier to work for any load, and thus any output power level, and then simply use impedance matching to go to the final load value. So even with a 10 volt supply and a 50 ohm final load, you can deliver any amount of power. So again, I have my previous circuit that was designed for a load of 500 ohms, and rather than leaving the load in parallel with the LC circuit, I put it in reference to ground and connected it through a DC blocking capacitor. So it's far more common to have your load in reference to ground. And then on the right side, I have the exact same circuit, but this time we have a 50 ohm load, which is connected through an impedance matching network that transfers the 500 ohms of the initial circuit to the 50 ohms that we want to have. So I won't go into too many details on the circuit, I covered that in a previous video, so go check that out. But long story short, both circuits should now be delivering the exact same amount of power. So if we run the simulation, we can see the power being delivered on the first circuit, and the power delivered on the second circuit is almost identical. And of course, in a similar fashion, we can design our initial circuit to go for smaller loads. So here I have a different circuit that has the same Q factor of 10.8, but this one was designed to drive a load of 5 ohms. And then on the right side, we have again the final load of 50 ohms, and an impedance matching network that goes from 5 to 50. And again, if we analyze the delivered power, so what is delivered to the 5 ohm load and what is delivered to the 50 ohm load, we see that they both have the same amount of power. Now, impedance matching circuits will have an extra benefit. Other than load conversion, they will provide much needed filtration. Since one of the things that the class C amplifier is known for is large amounts of distortion. Since you're driving the amplifier in small pulses, and the rest of the time it's just a damped oscillator, the output will not really be a clean sine wave. So the impedance matching circuit will also be useful to reduce the output frequency harmonic content. And to show this off, I prepared a reference circuit that is delivering power to a 500 ohm load, and then I have another circuit that delivers power to a 50 ohm load through a single stage matching network, and we also have a similar circuit that delivers power to a 50 ohm load, but which goes through a Pi filter or a two stage matching network. So this network was designed to go from 500 ohms to 20 ohms and then to the final 50 ohms. And we can analyze these three circuits in multiple ways. So first of all, we can look at the various sine waves. So if there's enough distortion, you will notice the difference. I mean, here the green has, well, this flat area and the other two don't but this isn't always really a good analysis method. Second thing that we can do is look at the FFT spectrum. And here, if we split our free measurements into three different plots, we can start to make out that the first signal has the most amount of distortion and the other two are a bit cleaner. So the level of the harmonic starts to get smaller and smaller. And finally, we can do a proper distortion analysis by using the four statement. So this statement will create a distortion calculation for the signal of interest at the frequency of interest. So we can see this using the error log. And for our reference circuit, we can see that we have 5.7% of harmonic distortion. For the single stage matching network, we have 2.2%. And then for the two stage matching network, we have 0.95%. So based on the implemented matching network, you can fine tune the value of how much distortion actually gets delivered to the load. Usually you will want as little as possible. Finally, one of the main reasons why you would be interested in the class C amplifier is its efficiency. While the class A has a maximum theoretical efficiency of 50%, the class B goes up to 78.5%, the class C, in theory at least, can even reach 100%. Now, you won't be getting 100% in real life, of course, but in general, real life designs will present values between 60 and 90% of efficiency. And typically, the class C will be more efficient than a class A or B built with similar components. So how do you make the class C amplifier efficient? 
or inefficient for that matter? What sort of design considerations should be taken into account? Well, other than the losses in the passive elements, they will all have some sort of parasitic elements, there are two important considerations to take into account. The conduction angle and the amplifying elements output impedance. Efficiency will improve as the amplifying elements output impedance becomes smaller in reference to the load, and depending on the load to amplifying element impedance ratio, there is a specific conduction angle for which peak efficiency should be obtained. Now, output impedance is a tricky subject. Some transistor datasheets will offer some information on this topic, maybe specifically for a class C operation, or maybe just large signal parameters, but that is not always the case. So fortunately, for example, this transistor, so the MRF313, which specifically is a radio frequency NPN transistor, offers some interesting information. So for example, what sort of power gain you have, what sort of efficiency you can get, so I'm guessing with the same class C amplifier, and what sort of input and output impedance you have. So they're telling you the exact complex impedance that the transistor presents, so you can create a proper matching circuit both on the input and on the output. But this is not always the case. So in certain cases, you just have to wing it somehow and experiment a bit with your circuit to find just the right combination. Now the conduction angle on the other hand is a bit easier to control. So to show this off, I prepared a simulation. So here we have circuits similar to the one that we had previously, so the same LC resonator and the same matching network. I just changed out the transistor and the two main ways in which you can adjust the conduction angle is by adjusting the input signal and the bias point of the amplifying transistor. So to adjust the input signal, I prepared this voltage source that has a fixed value plus an extra parameter and I'm stepping this parameter from 0.1 to 1 volt in steps of 0.05 volts. So we can see in small increments how this parameter affects the efficiency of the amplifier. And to evaluate this efficiency, I prepared this set of automated measurements so we don't have to manually do the efficiency. So first of all, I calculate the output power, so the average of the output voltage times the output current. Then I also measure the input power, so again, the average of the input voltage times the current going through the supply. And finally, I calculate the efficiency from these two parameters. Now, regarding the amplifying elements bias point, you can simply use a resistor to ground, or sometimes an inductor is used to ground, and then just apply through a DC isolating capacitor, or you can go to a different potential. So I also prepared this other circuit in which this base resistor is going to minus 2.5 volts. So this should force a smaller conduction angle. Finally, the last thing that you could do is add a resistor in the emitter of the amplifying transistor. So to get some negative feedback, sometimes this resistor also has a capacitor in parallel. But anyway, for all three of these circuits, I prepare the same efficiency measurements to see just how they behave. So if we run the circuit, we don't even need to look at any waveforms, we just need to finish the runs. And now we can look into the error log to see for each of the steps how the various measurements turned out. So for our first circuit, we hit a peak efficiency of about 89%, but you can see that this efficiency level is quite sensitive, so with a small increase or decrease in the input signal, we drop off very steeply. So with smaller voltages, you're not driving the transistor into saturation. With larger voltages, you're oversaturating it. So this is quite sensitive. But we're getting a pretty decent efficiency. With our second circuit, so the one that has the negative bias, we have even better results, so 91.2%. But we can also see that this 90% is far less sensitive to the input signal. So we can see that we have quite a bit of input signal variation and the efficiency stays in the same area. Finally, for our last circuit, the one with the emitter resistor, I use quite large resistors, so we can see this in the efficiency, we're down to 81%. But again, we can see that this is quite a stable amplifier and the efficiency is quite stable with input signal. So now I'll take one of the best steps from each of the three circuits and simulate them standalone without stepping through the various input voltages. So we're left with 1.05 volts for the first circuit, 4 volts for the second circuit, and 2.2 for the third circuit. So now when we simulate them standalone, 
we can recheck the efficiency, so 89%, 90.9, and 80.7, so almost the same values as before. But now we can clearly look at the various conduction angles. So to check this, we can look at the collector current in the various transistors, and just zoom in into a single one of these. So we can see that for our first transistor, so the green trace, we have a slightly larger conduction period than for the second transistor, so the trace in blue. The second transistor is the one with the negative offset, so this made the conduction angle a bit smaller, but the peak current higher. And for the third transistor with the emitter resistor, we have a wider conduction angle. So this emitter resistor did reduce the gain, it stabilized a bit the circuit, and it extended a bit the conduction angle. Now in general, depending on the output impedance of the transistor and the load of the oscillator, there is an ideal conduction angle that you can calculate, but it's so difficult that usually you won't be doing that, but rather fine-tuning the input signal until the highest efficiency is obtained. And one easy way to do that is using a circuit simulator. So you can easily automate this sort of efficiency measurements and input signal parameters. In the end, the Class C amplifier is a widely used circuit in radio frequency electronics, mainly in transmitters, as well as in industrial circuits where high frequency current is needed. Most often, it's used in continuous wave applications so not all types of modulations are easily supported, and an important part in using the amplifier properly is understanding it. But theory is just that. It stays on paper, or in the simulator in this case. So join me next time when I try to apply these insights and build such a circuit and afterwards take it for a test ride, just to see if it actually works as it's supposed to. And with that said, Hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.